Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us for this month's Bloom Business Series. My name is Corey Wolf. I'm the Urban Revitalization Manager for Downtown Inc. And today we are talking about public art. Today's event is made possible by our presenting sponsor, PNC. We thank PNC for their continuing support of our 2023 Bloom Business Series. So today we'll dive into the topic of public art, wall murals, window painting, sculpture, and anything in between. We'll hear from artists as well as the folks behind these scenes, regulating, funding, and guiding these projects to success. It can take a massive amount of work to make public art projects come to life. And we hope our conversation today will help merchants and other community members understand the methods and resources utilized in our city, county, and across the Commonwealth. Let's welcome our panelists. First, we have Ophelia Shambliss, artist and educator with Oliver Bliss Designs. Ophelia is a fine artist and muralist who specializes in community engaged murals that provide representation and a sense of place and belonging. Ophelia has more than 30 public art installations across the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Next is Samantha Pearson, Healthy Communities Program Manager for the Pennsylvania Downtown Center a statewide nonprofit promoting community development using the Main Street approach in communities across the Commonwealth. She runs the PA Walk Works program, a CDC funded PDC collaboration with the Pennsylvania Department of Health with the goal of improving individual and community health through environmental change, specifically helping communities become safer, more accessible and more inviting places to walk and bike to get to everyday destinations. A designer and community planner originally from the suburbs of Miami, Florida, she has lived with her family in walkable downtown Lewisburg, Pennsylvania since 2003. And our final panelist is Rita Whitney, Director of Communications and Engagement at the Cultural Alliance of York County. Rita is an artist and York community enthusiast. Through her work with the Cultural Alliance, she works to build a foundation of support for the arts and culture of York County. She's been involved in a variety of large scale public art projects over the last decade and has seen firsthand the scope of impact they can have on a community. Thank you to our panelists for joining us today. If you have any questions for any of today's panelists during the presentation, please submit them at any time through the Q&A or chat feature along the taskbar and we'll address them at the end of the program. So we're just gonna get started with some questions and I will direct the first to Sam, if you could kick things off. And then we'll hear from Rita and Ophelia as well. So where do you begin with a public art installation? In your experience, what's the starting point for a successful project? Is it identifying a location, potential artists, funding, or some other piece of the puzzle that lays the best foundation? Well, so at a very basic level, and, and hi, Corey, thanks for having me. <laughs> um, at a very basic level, and all of the above, any of the above, you can start anywhere and look for things converging. But at the same time, uh, you know, I do fundamentally believe in location, location, location. So if someone approaches you and says, I really want to put a mural on my, you know, the back of my garage and I'm in the suburbs. Obviously, that is not going to have the same impact as, as something that's going to, you know, be uh, adjacent to, visible from, or propelling for a public space. So 
um, you know, location really does tend to drive things. You can even find that you'll have people approaching you that really want to get involved, an artist, an owner. They might have an, a location idea, and it might not be where your, your project winds up taking place. You know, the it, your project could evolve uh, and and wind up on a on a different wall or a or pavement or or other surfaces um, as you as you work through the process. Thanks, Sam. How about you guys, Felia, Rita? I, I'd have to say I start with the why. Uh, a lot of that because I am a communicator. And to even to Sam's point where um, we started with a why for a project and originally it was going to be on a wall, but it was on a building that was up for sale. So it automatically meant that the, the wall was going to be temporary. So we actually changed the plan, had it in the same area, and then we didn't have a wall. So we had to build some steel structures. But very often it's I start with a why, figure out the where, identify the who, and then figure out how. Yeah, I totally agree with that. And I mean, as an artist, for me, it's always like the passion of the project, like something that sparks the thing. And then how do we get the kind of the community involved? But so I think it just depends on who it is that ha is the initial uh, driver of the idea or has that initial spark and then how they start building it in together. That's great. And this kind of rolls into our next question. And Ophelia, you talk about the why, uh, but how did you get started doing murals in the city of York and what kind of relationships and connections within the city have been beneficial for moving these projects forward? I got started doing murals in York by volunteering to help another muralist who was brought to York to do a mural in the Salem Square neighborhood. And he didn't have a whole lot of help. And I actually learned a lot from him about his process. And so I'd show up every day um, and help him do that. And then it really uh, brought home for me the need to do murals in some of the communities outside of downtown. So then I worked at building connections to some of these communities and then thought this would be great to get more art in all of these different areas. So I, again, went with the why of being able to create murals in neighborhoods and communities that normally do not get that attention. Rita, I know you have some uh, some stuff in here. Do you have anything to add? <laughs> I, you know, my experience, I got brought into kind of these projects because I'm not a public, you know, my art is not, you know, outdoor public art. That's not what I do or am good at. <laughs> I will leave that to the pros. Um, but I have been brought in to like facilitate a couple of different projects. And so that's kind of how I got started. Like kind of, I know a lot of artists. And so people who wanted, who had that spark, had that idea. Um, there was someone at the YMCA who wanted to, got a grant to install sidewalk murals, right? And so she was like, I don't even know where to start with this. I don't know a lot of artists. So then I was the connecting point that was like, okay, we can make this happen. Um, and then became like the project manager. So typically I've been brought in by someone who has funding or has a location or has an idea. Um, and then I've been able to execute on uh, what the idea is and kind of fill in the rest of the, the gaps. So for me, that's been my um, role personally in, in some of the art that's that I've been involved in. That's great. Now this next question. Oh, yeah, Sam. Um, I just wanted to note that, you know, you talk about connections to the city. It, re it really is. You need the artists. You need people with knowledge. You need people with skill. You need people with with. Um, you know, talent and vision, but you also need the permits. You need people who understand the process. You need, and they don't all have to be the same person. They, they don't all have to be the same organization, but you need to make those connections. And so, um, you know, those are relationships too. It's not just knowing an artist and an owner. It's also making sure you are up on the current code situation. You know what the funding opportunities are. And and again, it doesn't have, you don't have to be the person the professional, you don't have to be, I am, you know, in charge of all of this, but you have to understand that there are all these parts that are going to have to be pulled together. And then you work with people and they help you to do that. Yeah, that's a fantastic point. There's so many moving parts to these types of projects. Uh, our next question is for everyone. So that is, 
what is your advice for a small business owner who may want to facilitate or support bringing public art into their neighborhood or property? And that may mean they own the property or they do not own the property. So that is for anyone, whoever wants to go first. Hmm. I think Sam should go first. Yes. <laughs> I, I'm glad to, I'm glad to. Um, you know, I would say here that what you really want to do, and I think this has come up already, is be flexible. So while you may have a real propelling desire to see something happen and you either do or don't have control over space, if you are helping it to happen in general in your community, you may make it more feasible in your own space, even if you don't have full control over it. Um, could be that the property owner would see that something is happening somewhere else and that it, it isn't threatening and it's actually a positive and it helps business and, and then they would be more open to doing it in your own property. You could also look to collaborate and look to talk to people about options that aren't as directly connected to a building, right? You might be doing panels, you might be doing, uh, you know, sort of uh, inst installable sculptures. There are different ways of approaching it, but really being flexible and community minded, like not just about your own little space, but about the sort of entire environment that you're building together in your community. Yes. I have this whole list of things that I think about before I even start a mural or when I'm having conversations about it. And, and there, I, I call them my basics list. So it's securing the wall, whatever that surface is going to be, knowing the lifespan of that mural. Is this going to be ephemera? Is this going to be here temporarily? And you know, have they included that in their deed if it's going to be a permanent mural? You know, if they're going to put the building up for sale and does the other person agree to leave the mural in place? Um, consideration for how it's going to be maintained long term, outlining the maintenance and the responsibilities once I am done, who takes over that maintenance. Um, understanding the copyright of the image, uh, the artist's rights, you know, if it should need to be prepared, that they have first refusal, um, getting the community you know, getting the community to have buy-in and inclusion in this instead of artwork just showing up someplace. Um, who has approval rights? Who's paying for it? Because they're not always the same person. Um, what's the viewing distance of the mural? Is it, you know, you only see it from five feet away or you can see it for five blocks away. Um, maybe you can only see a part of it, you know, for a mile and then you get up on it all of a sudden you, you see the whole thing. What's showing for that little corner of it that you can see? Um, you know, so you think about the viewing distance. Um, what's the sun exposure? What's the viewing time? Is it a street that's 35, 40 miles an hour and it has too much detail for them to even see what's going on there? So think about those sorts of things. Um, choosing the right artist, the right visual message, understanding scale. Again, that goes back to the visibility, using the right materials and um, thinking about the logistics of installation. I will never install anything on a concrete wall again in my life. Um, there are some walls and surfaces that are more forgiving than others and, you know, knowing a lot about brick. So those are just some of the logistics. And then um, there was some com conversation about HARB. When we're living in a town as old as York, thinking about, you know, what are the rules in regards to that? HARB manages signage um, on buildings. It does not include murals and artwork. Um, but I think it's always important to understand that or be sensitive to putting artwork in communities that at least matches the community. You don't want to do a bunch of neon things, which won't hold up in the sun anyway, but being cognizant of the community that you're in. That's fantastic. Yeah, those are so many different details that I, I feel like uh, a lot of people don't realize go into it. There's so many of those pieces. And you really touched on our next question about the contracts and what they should include and uh, the different pieces of HARB and all the other permissions and permits that go along with that. Rita, did you have any, any other details you'd like to add to that? Um, no, not at this moment, I think, until we get to the funding portion of it. I see there's a lot of questions around that. So I feel like, uh, because that's obviously a huge piece of like starting that project. So I'll wait till we kind of get to that section and cover that. Great. And I saw one of our questions was about um, the RDA and the work that 
can be done or cannot be done. And I would say that the, the city RDA has been very uh, collaborative in these types of things. So yes, there are many permissions, permits, contracts, uh, and entities to deal with, but uh, the city has been uh, embracing these types of projects and the RDA is a place that you can talk to. Um, it's once again, a lot of different pieces, but it, it can happen. Um, our next question, so what are some of the most common challenges you see coming up with public art projects, which could be finding walls, space, consensus around the concept, public input, um, funding? So we can, uh, that's open to anyone to start. <laughs> oh gosh. <laughs> it's a challenging thing to approach, I think, right? Um, definitely the number one, one conversation it even came up you know we were talking about it yesterday Corey about um you know public art is it's it's visible right like there are when you have total access to any person in that geographic area um you're going to run into a lot of issues right or not even issues but conversations and questions and um so right now we are getting a lot of questions about um for example in new york the historical murals that have been installed um a while ago and all of the liens on those murals are pretty much up for most of them so and all that means for us logistically is that they're not protected anymore um the people who own those buildings that those murals are on could literally just paint them over at any time um you know if they wanted to and so the question is often um are we protecting those murals are we restore are those murals being restored um are they being changed or painted over like what's going to happen to them um, and so we have a lot of questions around that because essentially when those murals were installed, there was no plan um, for what was going to happen to them. There was no plan for maintenance. Um, we look at the installations of all of the, um, a lot of the sculptures, right? A lot of the sculptures on George Street, um, the big cat that's over in, um, what's that park called? Founders Park. Um, and those need maintenance. They need to be painted every now and then. They need, um, you know, to be restored in different for different reasons. And um, our public works department is not qualified to do that work, but the work often often falls on them. Um, and so, and it's really just a lack of of foresight and planning. And that's all. It's not anyone's kind of fault at this point, but. From here going forward, um, one of the big issues we need to address is, you know, where does that funding come from that maintains those pieces? Are we paying the artist 20 years later to fix the mural that they installed 20 years prior? Um, or do we put a piece of art up and we allow it to just go away in five years? Can we just allow that to be okay also if something is not lasting in perpetuity? Um, and it's really just deciding those things kind of ahead of time. Um, and again, we'll get to the funding piece of it, but that's a huge part of it. Um, especially in York County, we don't have public funding for arts um, in, in the county. So there is no pot of money that supports um, mural installations or sculptures or beautification um, that just kind of exists in perpetuity. We only have what individuals can gain and gather or write grants for. Um, so that's one of the issues truly because we don't have kind of a grand scheme look at what do we want public art in the York City and York County to look like? And then how do we fund it? Yeah, the, the, the plan, like even the, the murals of York, uh, they were designed as ephemera and they did have a lifespan, which was that 20 years. So once that lifespan was up, anything could happen to them. They could come down, they could be repainted. Somebody could make a new arrangement to go over them. But then there's the artist's rights. Does the artist get first uh, refusal in terms of fixing them and, and maintaining them? But that's one way to deal with the long-term maintenance is to give them a lifespan, but then do they die in place? Because they look horrible when they do. And there are some murals out there that are designed to design it, die in place, meaning you have to keep them there. You can't paint over them. They're just gonna look really horrible. But I think that we've come to the point where now we have better methods and materials that we can do murals and public art pieces that will last much, much longer and that are easier to maintain. So I think that is a critical part is to use different materials and methods so that you don't have to face that issue right away. And that could be built into the, the maintenance and sustenance plan. I, when it comes to challenges, I would actually also focus at the other end, like 
uh, Rita and Ophelia were talking about the end. Um, also at the beginning, there are challenges, especially depending on how many cooks are involved, uh, reaching consensus. You know, um, if it is a sort of smaller project and you know there are fewer people involved, it may be fairly smooth. Um, in more public settings and with more players, there may be a lot of very different ideas about what should happen in a place. And those can that can be just part of public process and, and a community growing and learning together. Um, it's a good opportunity, can be a good opportunity for public meetings and people to, to interact. Um, but it's also an opportunity for people to be, to be disappointed, you know, like they get their heart set on one thing. And then as, as time and funding pass, you know, um, the, the final project is, is sort of not what they had originally envisioned. But I also think, again, we should always remember that and, and remind people that there's not just one mural, right? Like there's not just one public art project. Uh, we should be thinking about this as sort of a, a, a form of breathing, right? The, the community living through art and they don't, you don't just put, put everything into this single work and then walk away. But over time, different elements and different ideas can appear in different places. Absolutely. I, I believe in getting community buy-in for areas that I'm putting in public art to get their feedback. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the people who approve it and have to live with it are not always the people who are paying for it. So you have to, as Rita mentioned, you know, figure out which of those drivers and try to um, address them all. Um, I've done murals that were kind of connected to political bodies, which can get very complicated and onerous and take a, a long time and it's an extreme process, but just being able to work with all of those different stakeholders to come to a consensus because it will last much longer and have a lot less um, discussion and dissension about the piece going forward. Thank you, everyone. Um, our next question, I'm gonna direct to Rita first. Um, so public art is more than just wall murals. As we know, we've talked a lot about wall murals, but can you give other examples of any other great public art projects throughout your county? Absolutely. I mean, and this is something that's very dear to my heart because, you know, we're talking about public art. We're not just talking about beautifying spaces. Um, the, to Sam's credit that she's been kind of bringing up a lot, there is so there are so many different reasons that you would want to create public art, and it has such an incredible impact. I mean, the impact that a public art piece can have in a community, in a space where people live, is transformational in those areas um, where those are created. And so, and they can be, you know, lots of different reasons. So like there, um, for a short term, there were like playful sidewalks kind of around the town, right? And they were like murals that were painted on the sidewalk out front of schools in different locations that were interactive and kids could like play and dance on them, the, the idea being active. Um, I would point out uh, the red sand project that the YWCA does every year where they pour sand into the cracks of the sidewalks as a way to represent um, people who get lost to human trafficking and the people that fall between the track, uh, the cracks and aren't seen. And that's, that's a piece of public art to bring visibility to a very specific and very important cause. Um, uh, there's um, a really kind of an obscure one that I love that is um, this artist named Adam Del Marcel who lost his brother to a heroin overdose and created a series of videos um, of his brother that he would then put a projector, a high powered projector in the back of his truck. He would drive around to the neighborhoods where he knew that known drug dealers lived and he would project videos of his past brother on the sides of the houses of these people. Um, and that's, a, I mean, until he had to drive away. That's an incredibly impactful, visible public art project that makes a statement. Um, I would also mention the, the most recent, um, we have the first ever African American sculpture in um, York County was just recently installed outside of the Goodrich Freedom Center, um, which is the public sculpture of um, William, William Goodrich, which is, I mean, all, first of all, it's a beautiful sculpture of its kind. Um, and so even that making the statement of how um, important that history is to York City. Um, there are just a lot of really important pieces that exist. I mean, I would even throw out like the shoe house, right? I mean, <laughs> it's kind of a silly one, but it's also, that's 
absolutely art um, and it's something people come and see, but all of those different pieces serve different purposes. And I think it's really important to think about the impact that you can potentially have with a piece. Um, and, and, you know, I'm, I'm still starting with the why, right? <laughs> Ophelia, do you have any uh, any thoughts on this? I, I think, because I know at one point, and, I, and it might have been the Cultural Alliance, was putting up mosaic murals at the different public housing um, locations. And, and they were beautiful, and they were well thought out, and, and the community came out and put them together. But sometimes we have to think long term and, and think about the uniqueness of those murals, because then they also become a different kind of stigma. Um, I heard someone asking about uh, apartment developments and where to look for them. And they saw one apartment development and found out it was a public housing development. So they didn't qualify to live there. And then someone told them, well, all the public housing de developments have those mosaic murals. So it became a branding um, that became more of a um, an opposite thing of what they really wanted it to do. Instead of giving something to that community to say, here's some art, um, but it became a branding of, you're all labeled this way. So think about uniqueness um, to the, the different communities. Great, now Sam, I mean, are there other projects that you can think about throughout the Commonwealth that aren't necessarily wall murals? Uh, sure, I have, uh, I have an affinity for things that are, are not actually on walls. Um, I would point out actually that Lancaster, City of Lancaster did a, uh, asphalt art project, uh, which means they painted areas of pavement uh, at a key intersection. Um, they, what they were doing was actually helping to redefine the intersection, make uh, pedestrian crossing shorter and uh, reorganize parking so that it was safer um, and more beautiful. Um, that was actually, you know, funded through an international foundation. Uh, was very exciting. It's very challenging at the same time to do that in Pennsylvania. It's very challenging to get permission to paint uh, uh, road surfaces other than with what's called MUTCD, uh, Manual and Uniform Traffic Control Devices, uh, official um, patterns. But it's still inspiring. And there are other you know, asphalt surfaces we have access to. Um, just recently, there was uh, info about um, in a webinar from the DVRPC about uh, some great pavement murals from uh, the Tacony Frankfurt watershed uh, group. They had, especially during the pandemic, worked with artists to um, you know, activate those surfaces and, and make them more sort of accessible for people. Um, you can also paint, it might be on a, a vertical surface, but it might not be a wall. So examples of that, you know, you see trailers, you see um, uh, containers, uh, you know, maybe along a trail, it might be a, a container that's set out that is actually a storage uh, site for um, uh, a facility, you know, a facility like for kayaks or, or bike share or something like that. Uh, those can be painted um, literally very near to me. Uh, actually in downtown Lewisburg where I live, um, there's a new project called Art at the Piers and it's actually, it's on vertical surfaces but they're industrial ruins. So they are concrete piers uh, built during the depression, the Great Depression, sorry, <laughs> um, uh, you know, coming up on a hundred years ago and they are in a state of ruin. They no longer have railroad tracks above them, but you know, this, this, large collection of piers has been sort of a new focus for the town now that a rail trail has gone in. So in the time since the rail trail appeared and the piers became sort of a part, a visible part of town again, even though they were always there, they'd been there for decades in the middle of town, but sort of hidden, the trail brought them to the fore and now they have, they're a site for a chalk art, they're a site for murals, there's a mural that went up once and is now being redone, there's, there's, uh, yoga, there are people making, uh, uh, you know, uh, labyrinths, you know, meditation labyrinths, there, there's all sorts of stuff happening there. And that is not like on the side of a conventional building. In fact, there, it's actually been a bit of like the consensus I talked about is hard to reach because some people want, you know, some people wanted to come in and power wash the 
the peers, but other people are like, no, we need the, the ruinedness of them. And some people wanted to paint on them with yogurt so that it would grow like different things like mosses and things like that. So um, there's a lot of different uh, sort of threads combining. And I would say if people want to come and visit it, it's an interesting compromise, right? Like they're not covering the entire pier. There is sort of accessible versions of art, but there's also just looking at the aging and the weathering and appreciating that. Yeah, I've, I've had a few murals where there was not a wall and they were in neighborhoods and communities where there was a lot of walking traffic where I've then resorted to work painting on steel structures, you know, and then they can get very heavy. One of them is 600 pounds and the others are three towers that are 200 pounds each, but they become a permanent part of that community. And it's a walking community. So people have an opportunity to interact with them and their ground level. Great, thank you. Uh, yeah, it's really interesting hearing about everything uh, uh, outside of just wall murals. I know that we touched on in the very beginning about uh, downtown New York, we have a lot of window painting, which kind of avoids a lot of the contractual pieces that um, we know is is uh, cumbersome at times, but there are so many different window murals that are happening. And I'm happy to say uh, to what Sam was speaking about, uh, we are currently working on downtown Inc and in partnership with the city of York and other entities doing our own asphalt um, creative artistry program to be able to um, make our rail trail crossing safer, more visible, but also infusing some artistry there. So that's really exciting. Um, so lifespan and longevity are important considerations in the planning stages of public art projects. I'm gonna ask Sam if you could comment on any best practices for evaluation, maintenance, repair, and upkeep for outdoor art. Are there processes and standards that can ensure that someone is responsible for a piece once it's installed? Uh, so these are all great questions. I, one thing I would just point out as a person who's been involved in like the architecture and building side of things for, for many years is that um, there's no such thing as no maintenance, right? Like people imagine you build something and then it's there forever. And so maybe if you make a bronze, but you're still going to have to clean it, you know, um, it's everything exists in the world and the world is messy, uh, especially outdoor art. It's exposed to the elements. It's exposed to sunlight, which is incredibly damaging, um, depending on the exposure, like what angle it faces, whether there's any overhangs or things like that. It may be very, um, we all need to remember that, that uh, you know, bricks and, and any masonry is basically a sponge. So there's a lot of moisture issues to deal with. Uh, but, you know, as long as we're approaching it, understanding that, that this is our element in time, you know, not everything is as passing as a Christo wrap or something like that, but it's, um, it, it will have a lifespan. Uh, we also have to watch out for um, people who want to add to your art, uh, whether with their own artistic contributions or with trash or, you know, like there are different ways that people interact with these things. So it is good to think about it in terms, we've talked, there's been some mention of having different legal arrangements with the owners, um, you know, the owner having a sort of sense of, sense of ownership of it. Uh, also having a practice of of highlighting if you you know maybe sort of checking in on your 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 murals um, maybe even advertising if there have if there has been a tagging or something and sort of saying to the community hey we kind of you know let's not have this you know let let's or let's make sure we have space for uh, you know like a, a a graffiti project you know where people are collaborating um, exploring their their artistry and not feeling the need to um, destroy other things that have already been put out there uh, I think actually uh, you know I would actually defer to Rita here on the legal um, uh, structures no, oh she says no <laughs> okay um, but or maybe to Ophelia like what kinds of um, uh, legal arrangements you should make um, and who you should get involved uh, to write up uh, that stuff in order to protect your things in the future. Yeah, I saw that in the Q&A, somebody asking about that. And I'm like, absolutely, 
you know, if it's a, yeah, if, you, if you're not sure, like legal counsel always, always good to have. <laughs> Yeah, I, I have a pretty extensive contract for public art installations that talk about expected lifespan and maintenance and a whole transfer of ownership. But I also always try to maintain personal ownership of my pieces and I actually check on them from time to time. Um, and there have been a, a few that I've actually gone in and, and done some touch up and there have been there's one piece that's been outside on a corner for going on 12 years now and it gets every now and then a few pebbles hit it from cars and, and traffic and things like that. But I also make sure I maintain a relationship with the city so that you know we're, we're partners in this uh, to keep it together. Um, of the 30 that I have out there, I've never actually had one of them tagged. I've had the wall tagged around it or in the empty spots. You know, and so I've been asked to come back and fill up those empty spots because you know they moved to the empty spots and they've never actually tagged the, the actual artwork. And Philadelphia's mural program basically began um, as an attempt to abate graffiti. And I think even graffiti artists have respect for art in places. And so it's, it's effective that way. Yeah, I think that speaks a lot to the power of public art. I mean, I know that there are many of these installations throughout York City, and it's nice to know that, I, I mean, you don't see much tagging or, or issues with those, which is great. Uh, so, um, we obviously need more of those. We need more murals. We need more public art, good stuff like that. I know a lot of people have had questions about uh, funding. So Rita, I'll ask you this question. Finding funding for public art projects can be a daunting endeavor. Can you give some examples of local funding sources or some examples of how people and organizations have gotten creative and executed projects with limited or no funding. And I feel like there's a few specific projects that you've worked on and you and I have worked on that could fit into those many categories. Yeah, all right, here we go. <laughs> um, and, and again, this is very um, York County kind of specific. I'm gonna give you a broad overview of like what I know and I'm aware of. Um, there's essentially three ways to, fund a mural. If you really kind of mural or mural or piece of public art, you know, that are kind of the main ways to do it. And that is um, like private funding. Um, a business wants a mural on the side of their building. They hire an artist and they pay for the mural. Um, and then there are things like sponsorships, which is something that's kind of in, in, you know, you would pitch the idea and a company might put in part of the money to, um, to help pay for the thing, but they want something in return typically. Um, so if it's maybe part of like advertising for them, maybe there's a reason for the mural, but you would get like individuals or companies to sponsor the mural being installed. Um, but typically they would get something kind of in return for that. It's a kind of a contractual like agreement between the two things, um, which is also how a lot of events are um, managed as well. You would get a sponsorship and then a corporate sponsorship and then can pay for that. And there's that is much more available than maybe you might think that it is. Um, it's a, actually a very viable avenue, especially in York, um, York County. Um, and then the other way, of course, being grant funding. Here's the thing about grant funding. Um, in most cases and scenarios, you have to fit what you're doing into a box. So the grant would be for projects that, um, incur I'll speak about like the sidewalk murals that we installed years ago. Um, the grant money funded an, a creative project that got people active and moving. And so all of the, the art had to fit um, what the grant specified. You know, you could get a grant for, um, you know, you could get a grant for beautification from some particular sources. You can get a grant for something that's like, okay, this speaks to um, an inclusive community or this item talks about something really specific. Um, so it can be challenging sometimes because, you know, if you're an artist, you're making a piece, it doesn't always fit into this box of exactly what the funding matches. And I know Ophelia runs into that quite a bit where you really have to like match your art to, um, to where the money comes from. And um, that can be challenging and it can kind of change the scope of your project, but it is a way to do it. Um, in your county, like I said, we don't have public funding for this. We don't have an office of public art. Um, or anything like that, which does exist in most, uh, I don't know about most, but many other places. Um, you know, even Lancaster has an Office of Public Art. It's a little different now, but um, there is 
a, a go-to place that handles all of that, um, that is a government entity, essentially. Um, you know, you go to bigger cities like Philly or Pittsburgh, they, they have that. They have money for these pieces, and then they have someone who is kind of in the seat of helping you fulfill on installing that. They have a vision. Um, so we just don't have that here in York County. And this is not just a plug for the Cultural Alliance because we try to do our best to fill that gap, but um, we are an entity that tries our best to bring in money from um, the national level, the NEA and the state. We are the partner for the Pennsylvania Council on the Arts, which does provide funding into our county and then it's dispersed through us. Um, here's the problem though, unfortunately. So we used to have in York County, um, we fund in York, Adams, Franklin, and Fulton counties actually for the state, but we used to have project funding. We used to have money that was available from the state that would then um, fund things like public art and murals. And that money has been shifted. Um, they decided to invest in creative entrepreneurs rather than projects. And that's amazing. And I love that too. And it does mean that um, there is less money for projects like this currently. Um, it's something that we at the Cultural Alliance are very focused on shifting and like finding new sources and avenues for that money. And long-term trying to get public funding into the county, to be totally honest, put our cards on the table. Um, over the next few years, we are campaigning to get public funding that would really bolster um, the availability of this money in York County and York City um, and be able to fund a lot more of these kinds of projects. Just right at this moment, that doesn't specifically exist. Um, so I would recommend looking into um, grants from like, gosh, there are places like, you know, we almost got a grant from Golden Paint to put in a mural, which was like, they're gonna supply all of the paint. So definitely like you can look into bigger companies a lot of big companies have grant programs, um, you know, Dawn Dish Soap. I remember Sam, uh, Sam Dorm, um, who's kind of like our big community grant writer, speaking once and she was like, look around your house at the items that you use every single day. And those companies probably have grant programs that you can write to. I think she, she was like, you know, Bissell, uh, Kellogg's, like those places, even though they're like large companies, um, sometimes you can get grant money from them because they are so big, they have money to give. Um, so that can be a, a good place to start. Um, you know, we have, so that's kind of on the macro level, I would say on the county level, um, we do our best to give out information when something is a fit. Uh, so for example, we just partnered with Downtown Inc. to do welcoming communities annual, we do welcoming communities. Now that is technically an events grant, for example, but we have had people throw an event where they created a piece of public art. Um, they just did a, I think J-Rock did, the graffiti artist did a, a mural on the side of a shipping container for, I can't remember the organization's food name. Bank. For the food bank. Um, there's one more recent than that. But anyway, we, uh, as the resource for the county, we do our best to fit you in as best as we can and to find money for your projects. So the number one thing I would say is really just start talking to people um, can be the best kind of resource for finding funding for a project. Get really excited about it, start getting people on board with it. Um, you can have a fundraiser for a mural. You could have, sorry, there's other ways to do it also, I guess, you know, you could um, be like, well, I'm going to sell photo prints of the mural. And if you kick in 20 bucks to the mural, then you'll get a photo print of it later, something like that. You can get really creative with how you fund. Um, on that note, I'll scroll through the questions and, and see if I missed any like really specific questions. Um, but I would also say, you know, you mentioned, um, you know, how can I do this on a budget? There's lots of ways, but pay your artist. Uh, murals are expensive. Um, when I have paid for murals, it's like three to five thousand um, dollars for the artist, and it because it's just an insane amount of work. And the skill is very specific because you do not want to invest that much in a mural that then falls off very very quickly. Um, and uh, yeah, that's really important piece of it. Um, 
Okay, I'm gonna pause, let anybody else jump in. I'm gonna read through the, the questions in the Q&A and see if there's anything specific I can try to answer that I didn't already. I did just wanna say, follow on the idea of other places having existing uh, budgets for art, like municipal budgets. So that's mm -hmm. actually something you can also lobby for with you know 1% uh, for art as a program, right? Like you can ask for that. You can also, um, sometimes that can be actually a stipulation for public funding of projects. It can, um, you know, it's it's something to pursue. Just making sure that your your community actually has that sort of ongoing commitment. I think that's a really important piece of it. So we just did um, uh, a a recent study. Um, the YCEA and Cultural Alliance uh, teamed up to do a very massive study on um, public funding and what that looks like in a lot of other counties across the country that are similar to York County, and then how those funding pieces are structured. I saw somebody in the questions asked about, um, does the does the owner typically of the property kick in a percentage? You know, all of that is negotiable. Um, consider, if you take nothing else away, everything is negotiable. Ask. Um, <laughs> make things work for, for everyone. There's no right or wrong really way to do this. Um, it's really just an intricate puzzle and you just have to fit the pieces together. Um, but there are places who, you know, every time a developer develops a property, they kick in whatever percentage um, of that project has to go to support public art. That is one way that people make it, um, you know, financially feasible for the long term. And then there's a pot of money that is used to upkeep over, over time. And so those two things kind of feed each other. Um, does everyone love that model? No, obviously, but um, it is one potential model that we're kind of looking at. Um, you know, uh, uh, potentially lobbying for in the next year or two. I I, th I think you're right. There are several possibilities, and sometimes you just put a mural up on a wall anyway without asking your permission. But that's neither here nor there. But there's also <laughs> profession <laughs> professional organizations that you can become a part of to find out more about the contracts and the expectations and resources. And that's publicarts.org, which I'm a member of, and I get you know, um, information through there and, and stay abreast of what the, the standards are and the expectations are. Um, but for artists to actually take advantage of those resources uh, that are available to them in their industry that are helpful to them. Um, but yeah, very often I just, like I said, I start off with the why about, this is why we're doing this mural and then try to get funding to support that part of the mission. I would actually also follow up on something in the funding, like with having the um, building owner pitch in. There are some, you know, in some places you may be wanting to lift up a community that does not have as much uh, capital in, in, embedded in it. So this can be part of um, bringing capital, you know, bringing investment to a place. Um, you can also, it can also be part of stimulating people to make improvements. So it could be that preparing the surface is on the, the owner, and that could involve some building repairs, uh, you know, cleaning and uh, uh, patching and things like that. And maybe that is their contribution or in, uh, you know, another setting, it might be they pay half of the, the outright costs. So, you know, it, it, again, it's flexible and it's very site dependent or program dependent. Um, there are lots of different ways of thinking about it. And similarly, um, I think there's been some questions about how you find an artist uh, and it that really varies. Sometimes there are people just itching to do work. There are sometimes people who know people who know people. My uncle is actually a big, huge muralist who's done stuff for years um, in like all over the Eastern seaboard. Um, you never know, but uh, sorry, not uncle, he's a, second cousin, how do you describe that? Uh, Ray Guzman. But um, we there's also the possibility of say working with uh, local organizations to put out an RFQ, what's called, it's a request for qualifications. You can just say, we are interested in finding artists who are, have the ability to do projects in our community and are you know available and willing. We're assembling a, a list of them. That RFQ people submit, you know, their names and their qualifications, and then, 
you have you have sort of a resource that many different people in the community can use and, and look through. Um, that's a tool that wouldn't be something that an individual would do, but it could be, you know, uh, uh, an arts organization, a, a community community organization like Downtown Inc. or something like that. We also have in York County, we have York 365, which is a fantastic resource for finding artists. Um, there's over 200 artist profiles on york365.com. It also shows arts and cultural events, but there's a huge listing of artist profiles. And you can literally search by what type of art they do. You can search for murals. And I think at least like 30 artists come up. Um, and that's people, you know, they have varying levels of experience, but it's absolutely a place to start because you can see previous work that they've done to see if their style fits what it is that you're looking for. Um, oh, okay, so a couple of specific questions in here. So um, are there funds available to restore a public mural? No, essentially, short answer, there's not. Um, <laughs> so that is a concern, uh, like we were talking about with a lot of those historic murals on the sides of buildings. Um, I would say though, that if you wanna save a, a mural, uh, um, there are a lot of vested into individuals who are interested in funding those things. And your county is a really interesting place. We have a lot of really major philanthropists who are pretty easily accessible um, comparatively, I would say, to other places um, and, and people who are really interested in kind of doing that work. So asking around and just kind of like sussing out who is really invested in those murals um, or that work that might want to like individually create a grant. Um, we have a few different foundations. We have Powder Mill Foundation. We have Wareheim Foundation. Well, that's in Hanover, but still um, that you can submit grant requests to, right? So if you look for like local foundations, um, those are organizations that, you know, have to give out a certain amount of their funds every year to like meet certain requirements of what they are actually like granting back out. Um, and they have pretty loose standards for, not standards, loose um, requirements for what they grant to. Um, so I think that is a good, those are also like kind of good options, but really finding the person who's um, emotionally invested in helping you kind of create those is, is helpful. Um, and then for Cultural Alliance specifically, we have grants that are for individual artists right now. Like our focus is on um, how do we help artists build their career and make it more sustainable for them to live in York County. Um, and so instead of our focus being on, let me give money to an outside entity who would then pay an artist, our focus is on let's give money directly to the artist so that they can build a stronger foundation for their business or for their artistic career. And then they can do uh, more projects that are within line with their personal mission as an artist, if that makes sense. So it's a bit of a shift in mentality, um, but I think it still can work for this. So if you find an artist who really is wants to utilize uh, um, creating a piece of public art and it's going to really help them create a showpiece for their career, there are avenues for that. But it really needs to start with the artist. Um, at the moment. And like I said, we are always looking to diversify where our funding comes in and then how we're able to disperse it out. Um, and I'm always open for conversations around things and I will absolutely do my best to point you in the right direction. Um, I'm sure Cher Corey will share contact information um, where I can share it. Thank you so much. Yeah, and so Culture Alliance, talk to Rita. I know I reach out to Rita all the time. So that's great. Um, our last question for everyone. Uh, so pitfalls to avoid. Uh, what do you wish you or a project that you've seen had known before they started and would have made the project go more smoothly and would have made it better? I feel like uh, Rita has uh, a thought, uh, anecdote perhaps. Go on YouTube and search for my name under York Story Slam and you can hear my detailed story of the biggest mistake I've ever made. <laughs> um, about um, installing a piece of public art and um, the nationality of the people that I was working alongside in the community and the artists that I hired and the work that went up. So I went in very blindly as a white woman trying to bring art into a mostly not white neighborhood. And I offended a lot of people. Um, and I, you know, I just say that very honestly, um, because there's, there's a lot of that in in York, we have just there. There's a lot of um, 
racial segregation here. There just is. And um, I think that it's a really important thing to talk about when we are talking about bringing art into a place. Um, I came in and I did my best to, at the time with what I had to, um, listen and get public feedback. We gave out surveys, we talked to people, we met with the neighborhood association um, and it still became a huge, um, like an, an issue. And so I think there's just a lot to think about there and then making sure that it's um, really community driven rather than being, you know, me as a person asserting really, really anything. Um, so for me, that's the, the biggest lesson that I have, have ever learned. Um, and, uh, <laughs> not eager to uh, make that mistake again. Um, for me, I don't know if it's a, <clears throat> well, I guess it is a long-term lesson, but something I always try to think about, so much of doing public art has nothing to do with painting. Um, it's negotiating and managing relationships. Um, I mentioned before that sometimes there are stakeholders coming from different directions and the person that's paying and the person who has to live with it and the person who has approval over it don't always have the same vision. So working really hard, and I think that's where my communication background comes in handy, to make sure that each of those groups understands what we're trying to do and that we are in alignment. Because by the time I get to painting, I wanna paint in peace. So I wanna iron all that stuff out in advance and make sure that everybody's on board and, and hear everyone and be empathetic to what it is that they want to see and feel about this piece. And so like I said, a lot of it has nothing to do with painting. So you can't rush to an image, you know, that, oh, I want to paint a bird, rush and start painting bird. No, no, no. let's hear this out first. So be prepared to do a lot of non-art stuff up front. Um, I, I want to share uh, just, I want to speak for the bricks. Um, this is this is akin to uh, the, famous modernist architect from Philly, uh, Lou Kahn, uh, had, would have a conversation with a brick, famously. And, um, you know, what does brick want to be? Brick wants to be an arch. Well, brick also wants to not be power washed um, or, or plastered, please know. Um, it depends on the age of the building and the construction of the building, but I cringe a little bit on older buildings that are solid masonry walls when I see them completely covered with paint. Um, and this this goes even not just for murals, but just paint. Um, that's That really is a challenge for the brick, uh, to challenge for the wall to maintain, uh, you know, over time with moisture pressures from both sides, indoors and out. Um, I much prefer seeing portions of walls or, you know, like signs like the old Coca-Cola signs where the paint has bare brick around it or between between the letters. Um, the newer walls that are called cavity walls, right? Where there's actually airspace inside the wall. Um, and this could just be, when I say newer, it could could also be a you know 50 years old, but a but a larger commercial building. Um, those can take more on their surfaces, but just be kind to your brick. Be, be, be nice to your masonry, please. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Sam. And thank you uh, to everyone. Thank you, Rita. Thank you, Ophelia, Sam. Um, there are so many great questions in the Q&A uh, and in the chat that we're going to have a follow-up email. I'm happy for anyone to reach out to me to discuss some of these things and the other contacts that we will have along in that email. Um, so thank you for joining us at today's Bloom Business Series webinar. I hope the information presented has been helpful to you, your business, your ideas. Uh, before we close, I wanted to draw attention to a few key announcements. The Welcoming Communities Grant for York City, uh, that goal of that program is to identify and provide financial support to just, sorry, sustainable community events and contribute to a creating, welcoming, and connected community for all in York County through diversity, accessibility, and cultural representation. The grant program has a total of $15,000 in grant funds for events taking place between May 1st, 2023 and May 1st, 2024 in the city of York. The letter of interest portal 
opens to February opens February 6th. This is a grant program administrated by Downtown Inc. made possible through the financial support of Better York, Powder Mill Foundation, and the York County Community Foundation, and in partnership with Cultural Alliance of York County. Uh, that link will be dropped in the chat. Uh, it's not too early to think about March 1st Friday plans for your business. Promotional information is due the Friday prior to each first Friday. Submit your promotions by February 24th uh, via the form below that will be posted in the chat. Promotions received by the deadline will be included in Downtown Inc.'s First Friday Facebook event, the Downtown Inc. First Friday webpage, and or in a press release sent to local media. And as you know, Downtown York's current wayfinding system is old with faded lettering, outdated branding, and inaccuracies. Over the course of 2022, the Downtown Inc. team has been working with nationally renowned consultant Dirk and Edson to plan the future of wayfinding signage in our community. Set for implementation in spring of this year, the new wayfinding signage will greatly enhance the visitor's experience with updated branding, vehicular and pedestrian oriented signs, and physical and digital interface components highlighting our community's walkability and wealth of restaurants, retailers, amenities, and more. Not to mention, they will also add to the aesthetic appeal of our historic downtown. Have any questions? You can email uh, Jonathan and his email will be posted in the chat. Uh, we appreciate all of our attendees joining us today. Thank you for your questions and your feedback and everything. Uh, we hope you'll join us for next month's Balloon Business Series workshop on Wednesday, March 15th at 8.30 a.m. Where, we, where we'll be discussing being a trail-friendly business. Thank you, everyone, and enjoy the rest of your day.